Hi, my name is Amy Poehler and I am the ninth to 10th grade counselor at Needville High School. And this is a meeting for eighth grade parents that are going to have ninth graders next year. So those would be the class of 2025. So it's for parents, it's for students, uh, anybody watching, I appreciate you watching. I normally would be having this meeting in the auditorium. So this is in my office. If a phone rings, I'll just mute it. Please excuse any interruptions, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. This is a meeting talking about graduation plans, what it takes to graduate from high school. Um, so then we'll lead into scheduling for ninth grade. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the slideshow. So this is an analogy of a graduation plan. So the state of Texas came up with this analogy. They said, graduating in the state of Texas, um, the first thing you have to have is the cupcake, just the cake of the cupcake. So if you'll notice, you've got the cupcake, you've got icing, you've got sprinkles, you've got a cherry. All of these things are wonderful, but the state of Texas says you must have the cake in order to graduate. So just that base, just that cupcake. And we'll talk about what the cupcake involves. That's what's called the foundation graduation program. Um, if you're familiar with the old graduation program, it was called the minimum plan. So that's what the foundation graduation program is. Then you've got things like endorsements, which are your, uh, your icing. You've got performance, performance acknowledgements, which are your sprinkles and your distinguished level of achievement, which is your cherry. So obviously here at Needville High School, we want you graduating with more than just that foundation cake. We want the icing, we want the sprinkles, we want the cherry. We're gonna push your students to get as much as they can and learn as much as they can in the four years that they're here. So, um, but then again, this is just an overview of an analogy and I will explain each one of these in great depth. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So the foundation graduation plan. So remember that's that minimum plan, just the cake. So this is what it takes to walk out with a diploma. This is the minimum plan. So it's, a, it's called the foundation plan. There's 24 credits. You have four credits of English language arts, three credits of math, three credits of science, three credits of social studies, two credits of foreign language, one credit of technology, one credit of physical education, one credit of fine arts, a half a credit of health, a half a credit of speech, and five state approved electives, five state electives. So 24 credits. So at Neville High School, we have eight classes in a day. Eight times four is 32. So you have plenty of opportunity to earn all these uh, credits for your foundation plan. But remember, we don't want you just getting that foundation plan. We want you to have some icing on your cupcake. And the icing on the cupcake are the endorsements. So the state of Texas says, by law, every incoming ninth grader must have declared an endorsement. They must have checked. There's a box on your scheduling sheet that you will check. It is written in law that you have to declare an endorsement. It's just like college. You have to pick a major. Now, you can change your endorsement anytime. Just like in college, you can change your major anytime. So all that involves is coming to the counselor's office and saying, hey, look, Ms. Poehler, I don't want to do business and industry anymore. I want to do the STEM endorsement. We'll sit down. We'll look at your schedule. We'll look at your four-year plan, change your endorsement, and then rework your four-year plan so that we can help fulfill that endorsement area. So it's very simple. It's not a big deal, but you do have to declare at least one endorsement. You can declare more than one endorsement. Uh, many students do that. Many students earn more than one endorsement just on accident. So I'm going to show you how to earn the endorsements a little bit later in the slideshow, but I just want to introduce you to the five endorsement areas. So you have STEM, business and industry, arts and humanities, public services, and multidisciplinary. Those are your five endorsements. You have to pick one upon entering ninth grade. Remember, distinguished level of achievement were, were those sprinkles on your cupcake, and we're going to encourage your students to get the sprinkles as well. To earn the distinguished level of achievement, the students must complete the requirements of the foundation program. So obviously, you got to get those 24 credits to graduate. You also have to complete Algebra 2 successfully, 
and you have to earn an endorsement. So many, many, many of our Neville High School graduates earn that distinguished level of achievement when they graduate here. So we're really proud of that. And we push your students to go for the sprinkles as well. Performance acknowledgements, I believe that was the cherry on top. So performance acknowledgements are um, by earning an outstanding performance in dual credit. So you might have earned a, a certain grade in a dual credit class, uh, bilingualism, um, scoring a certain score on a college board AP exam, um, scoring a particular score on a PSAT, an ACT, or an SAT exam, or earning a recognized business or industry certification. So at Neville High School, we have lots of different ways to get different certifications. Um, we have a culinary arts certification. We have a welding certification. We have a certified uh, nursing assistant certification. So it's a uh, medical assistant. It, it, it's got a certification as well. Um, there's a certification for Microsoft Office and we keep adding them every year. We're very proud of that so that our graduates not only have the foundation for high school, but they've also got some specialties and some certifications that they can use out in the real world. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk about each endorsement. So remember you have to pick one and you can change it anytime, so don't get too stressed out about it. I'm gonna go over what it takes to earn each endorsement. It's gonna sound very complicated. It's not very complicated, it's quite easy. So I'll go over it and then I'm gonna show you an example of what it looks like to earn each endorsement. So the first endorsement is the STEM endorsement, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So some career examples for STEM endorsement might be a forensic scientist or a computer engineer. Um, you do have to have Algebra two, Chemistry and Physics. All of those are required in order to earn your STEM endorsement. So the way that this slide reads is from bottom to top. So you would start down here at the foundation credits of 24. You have to get that. Everybody's got to have that cake. So in order to earn the icing on the cake, you have two options. Option one is by taking five math classes. Option two is by taking five science classes. So you're like, okay, Ms. Poehler, there's only four years in high school. How am I going to take five math classes? Well, some students start algebra in eighth grade. So they've got already got a math class before they ever enter high school. So then each year of high school, they take a math course and they've got their five math courses. Um, some students take two science courses their junior or their senior year, and that's how they get five science courses. So those are your two options for STEM. Lots of students earn it. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it's beneficial so that you can expose yourself to those higher level science classes and the higher level math classes, um, especially if you're wanting to be a, you know, an engineer of some sort, you're gonna want to, to be in those higher level math and science courses. And then at the top of the, of the slide, it has the pink box here, distinguished eligible for 10% automatic admission. So in the state of Texas, if you are in the top 10%, of your class, you are automatically admitted to any public university in the state of Texas, except UT. University of Texas, I believe they require 7%. So you have to be in the top 7%. So in other words, if you are ranked in the top 10% of your graduating class, so like if there's 250 freshmen, then you have to be number one through 25 then you can have you have to apply to the college but if you apply to texas a and m you will automatically be admitted into that college now that doesn't mean that you get your major of your choice you're not automatically admitted into the engineering program you have that's still a competitive program and they're still going to be looking at your upper level classes and your national test scores and all that you know that whole package but you are automatically admitted. That's any public university. So Baylor is not public, Rice is not public, excuse me, there's my phone. Um, those are not public universities. Um, we're talking about like A&M, Texas Tech, U of H, those kind of universities. But in order to be eligible for that, you must have that distinguished level of achievement, which is, is very simple. You just get the foundation, 24 credits, you take the algebra two and you earn an endorsement. So it's pretty much every, everyone will be earning those endorsements and taking that algebra too. 
So that's the STEM endorsement. Next, we're going to talk about business and industry. So this is another type of endorsement area. This is a, covers a wide range of career pathways and classes. There's lots of different classes that fall into the business and industry endorsement area. So the way to, um, let's see, you have an accountant, you have ag teachers, chefs, welders, you know, stock brokers, just anything, any gamut. So the way to earn the business and industry endorsement is you have to earn those foundation credits, those 24 foundation credits. And then in that big orange bucket, you see that you have to get one additional math class, one additional science class, and then you have to take two electives in the business and industry elective area. So remember in the foundation program, you have to take three maths and three sciences, but business and industry is telling you, no, no, you have to take an additional math and you have to take an additional science. So you're gonna be doing four maths and four sciences. And then two of the five of your electives from foundation must be in the business and industry elective area. It's very simple. Once you see this all, uh, I'll break it down for you here in a little bit. It's going to make a little bit more sense. And then, of course, it's got your distinguished at the top. OK, arts and humanities is another type of endorsement. So these are for people that are choreographers, graphic designers, um, you know, bands, um, your, you know, your artsy art minded person. So in order to earn the arts and humanities endorsement, you must obviously get that foundation credit. Everybody has to have those 24 credits for foundation plan. And then in this big orange bucket, you have to have your one additional math. So there's those four maths again, one additional science. So there's those four sciences and then four or more credits. So those five credits that the five electives you take, four of those must be in the same fine art, like art one, two, three, and four. You can't mix and match the fine arts. Or you can choose to do five credits in social studies, or you can do, choose to do four credits in Spanish. So there's a couple of different ways to mix and match the arts and humanities. So this is for students that take like four years of art or four years of theater art or four years of band, things like that. Um, most times students that, that get the arts and humanities endorsement don't necessarily choose it. It's just, it's what they love and they happen to take it all four years. So it's, it's a great endorsement. Then you have your public services endorsement. So these are for your nurses, police officers, firemen, game wardens, social workers, teachers, all public services. So in order to earn the public service endorsement, obviously you have to have that foundation. Everybody has to have that in order to graduate those 24 credits. There's your additional math again. So you're doing four math, you're doing four science because you add them to those three that are in the foundation plan. And then two of your five State electives must be in the public service elective area. So again, this is going to make a little bit more sense here in a few minutes. And then you have your multidisciplinary uh, endorsement area. So I compared this to back way back when, when we were in college and you were in college for so long that they eventually just graduated you with a general studies degree. So a multidisciplinary studies endorsement is it is something that when you're a senior and you're fixing to graduate and we're trying to determine what endorsement you earn, if you didn't take two in, you know, electives in the same endorsement area ever, then we can piece together the electives that you did take as long as you, you took the required additional social studies uh, class then you're, you'll be fine. You'll do, you'll get your multidisciplinary. So this isn't something that you choose. This is something that your senior year will sit down with you and say, hey, it looks like you haven't taken two business and industry endorsements or, you know, electives or two, um, arts, you know, uh, public service endorsement electives. So we're going to piece you, the two that you did take and we're going to call that a multidisciplinary study. So again, in the in the orange bucket, you still have to have that additional math, so there's your four math. You still have to have that additional science, so there's your fourth science. You have to have an additional social studies, so there's your fourth social studies. And then you have to have um, four more credits in different in different clusters, okay? Um, okay, so there's your multidisciplinary. So it's fixing to make a lot more sense to you if you're confused right now, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know. 
this is the paper version of a four-year plan and it seemed this seems when I break it down like this to make a lot more sense to people so this is a blank version of the four-year plan and then the next slide is one that I filled out so you can see at the top I have you know the name the grad year this is a couple years old so um, then I have that this student wants to fulfill the stem arts and humanities, public services, and business and industry endorsements, all four of those. Okay, so let's see how can a student fulfill all four endorsement areas. So if you look here in ninth grade, they took English one, in 10th grade, English two. So they took all four Englishes, 11th grade, English three, 12th grade, English four. So that's great. If you look in ninth grade, they took world geography, 10th grade, world history. So U.S. history, government economics. So there's all four of their social studies. So then you have all four sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, and then AP biology, your senior year. So that's good. And then all four maths, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, and then your fourth math. So when you ask me if, if, if parents ever ask me, like, what are what are colleges looking for? There, we call that the four by four. So you're, it's four classes of all four core. So English one, two, three, four, you know, four math, four science, four social studies, uh, four English. That's what colleges are looking for. They're still looking for that four by four. So then if you look in ninth grade, they took Spanish one, which is a foreign language requirement. And then they took band, which is an arts and humanities endorsement elective. And then they took human services, which is a public services endorsement elective and principles of agriculture, which is a business and industry endorsement elective. So there's freshman year, all eight classes. Sophomore year, they took for electives, they took Spanish two, which is a required uh, elective to, to complete the second year of their foreign language. They took health science, which is a public services endorsement elective. They took band, which is an arts and humanities endorsement elective and livestock production, which is a business and industry endorsement elective. So junior year, band, arts and, uh, arts and humanities, medical terminology, which is public services, health and speech, which are requirements. They're required electives to graduate, a half a credit of health and a half a credit of speech. We, we pair them together. Technology is also a required elective here at Needful High School, and it can be any technology. I'll describe that to you once we get to the scheduling sheet. And then senior year, they took BAN, which is their fourth Arts and Humanities uh, endorsement elective. So there's they, they completed their Arts and Humanities endorsement. They took Anatomy and Physiology. So I had that little arrow there, fifth science. So there's their five sciences. That completes the STEM endorsement. And then CNA, which has now been renamed to CCMA, which is a certified medical assistant program. And it's a two block class. And actually, um, sometimes they go to uh, administer medication at the nursing home, just kind of depends on regulations with COVID and whatnot. But at the end of that class, there is a certification and you can become a certified medical assistant. So um, that is also a public service endorsement elective. So as you can see, they they did complete. Oh, a business and industry uh, endorsement was was fulfilled through them taking principles of ag their freshman year and livestock production their sophomore year. So there's your two business and industry endorsement electives for uh, business and industry. So that is how they fulfilled all four endorsement electives. If they hadn't fulfilled any of those endorsements, then we would go and look at multidisciplinary. But because they did fulfill those, there's no need to look at multidisciplinary because it's kind of just a, cat, a catch all. Is there an advantage to having more than one endorsement for colleges? No, not really. You're more at, at an advantage if you focus on what's going to help you in college. For example, this student looks like they want to be a nurse just because you can look at the name and kind of tell that, but um, they want to be a nurse. So that AP biology class is really going to help them in college. The anatomy and physiology class is going to help them in college, medical term, health science. Those are all classes that are going to help this student in college uh, for nursing. That is what, what colleges will look at. They'll look at what classes that you took in order for your pathway for your major. Okay, so next slide. 
This is a transcript. It's an, a, a really old transcript, but uh, it is a transcript because I know parents kind of often wonder, what does this look like? You know, we, we tell students all the time, you know, you really got to buckle down and start working hard because what you do now matters, you know, for the rest of your life. It's going on your transcript. These are, this is what your transcript looks like. So this is an example of a transcript of a student that is in, just finished the fall of their sophomore year. So you can see that they've got English one on their transcript and English two. You've got, they've got uh, two, you know, two years worth of classes, 1617 and 1718. It also looks like this student took algebra one in junior high, just because I can see that the, the year is 1516 there. I can also tell that this student took honors English one because there is a Q in that column right there. Anytime you see that Q, that denotes that it was an honors class. Why they didn't use an H, I don't know, but they it's a Q. And so that Q tells the computer when calculating grade point averages, GPAs, that this 90 is not just a 90, it's a 90 times 1.2, which is our honors and AP and dual credit multiplier. So that 90 becomes a 108. And that 91 becomes a 1 point yeah, times 1.2 is a 109.2. So you can see the benefit in grade point averages of taking the honors courses and the AP courses and the dual credit courses. It really can boost your GPA. If your student's prepared for it, if they're willing to do it and you you think they're ready for it, then, uh, then the AP and the honors courses, dual credit courses are definitely an advantage for grade point averages. So oftentimes our you know top 10% or our top 10 in the graduating class, their GPAs all may be over 110 just because of all the rigorous classes with the weighted GPAs involved. So um, it, it can be beneficial to take those. The next slide is an example of another transcript after their sophomore year, the, the fall of their sophomore year. I kind of just wanted to show you what awarding credit looks like here at the high school. So if you'll look in that first red box for this first semester of English one, they made a 73, they passed. So the second semester they made a 66. The average of the two semesters was a 70. And because the average of the two semesters was a 70, we could award them the full credit of English one. Therefore, they don't have to repeat any English one. If you'll look down at the Algebra 1 box with the second red box, first semester they made a 74, second semester they made a 61. The average of the two semesters was a 68. So we could not award them full credit for Algebra 1. We could only award them credit for the first semester. So the following year, they'll be needing to take Algebra 1 just second semester. They don't have to retake the first semester, just the second semester of Algebra 1. Just to show you what credits look like, um, you know, everything at the high school is based on credits. So you take eight classes in a day here. Um, so you have an opportunity to, to earn eight credits by the end of your freshman year. You need six credits to be a 10th grader at the end of your freshman year. So it doesn't matter which classes it is. If you earn six credits, you will be a 10th grader the next year. If you don't get six credits, you don't become a 10th grader. You're a freshman again, and you're going to be working, trying to make up those credits and make up those classes to catch back up with your classmates, which can be done. It happens all the time. It doesn't mean that you're thrown off a whole year for graduation. It just means you're going to have to work a little bit harder to um, dig yourself out of the hole that you've dug. Okay, so this slide, a lot of words on here. So let me just start with, you know, STAR, EOC, credits. Oh, what is all this, Ms. Poehler? I mean, is it STAR? Is it EOC? It gets confusing. So from grades three through eight, you take the STAR test. And then when you get to high school, they call it EOC. So what that means, it's still the STAR test. It's just only associated with certain courses. So they call them EOC, end of course exams. So you will only take five star tests when you're in high school. And they are associated with English 1, Algebra 1, Biology, English 2, and U.S. History. So when you take those courses, 
at the end of those courses, you will take the end of course star test, EOC. That's why they call them EOCs. So let's say, for example, at the end of your ninth grade year, you take your English one star EOC test and you fail it. That doesn't mean that you failed the course. You failed the test. They're two separate entities. So you can actually fail the EOC and pass the course or the exact opposite. You can pass the EOC and fail the course. Either way, if you fail one, you're going to be retaking it. So if you fail the course, you're going to be retaking English one. If you fail the end of course exam, the star test, you'll be retaking it over and over and over. The best practices don't fail either one, <laughs> but I just want you to know that they are two separate entities. So we have lots of students that are seniors that are still trying to pass the English one EOC test. They passed English one a long time ago, the course, but they're still trying to pass the EOC star test. It's not a good predicament to be in. It's best to take those classes, those tests seriously and um, do your best and, and pass them when it's time to take them. So if you've wondered how your students have done on star exams, if you've, if you've never gotten results or if you'd like to go back and look at results, at the bottom of this slide, I gave you a website to go to. It's texasassessment.com. Your kids are fixing to hate me for this. So if you go to this website, the next slide shows you what it looks like. If you click on the, um, the button, it's right below the red box here. Don't click on login to student portal. Click on where's my unique access code. So if you click on where's my unique access code, it's going to take you to a page that says, okay, you don't know your kid's access code. So what's your kid's first name? So you would, you know, put their first name in John or whatever. And then the next, um, box it you it needs your social security number your student social security number and then next it'll ask you for their birth date you put in their birth date you hit go it gives you their unique access code and then it takes you directly to all the results of any star test they've ever taken and you can go even further and look at what questions they missed and you can look at what they answered and what the correct answer was it's really quite phenomenal and um, and it'll show you just it'll just give you, um, a, you know, it shows you everything they've ever taken in star. So your kids may hate me now, but that it's pretty phenomenal if you want to go in there and, and look and see how your student has done, at, at, you know, in the star exams previously. OK, the next slide. So time to think about college. You're like, wait a minute, we're not even in high school yet. Like, give us time as polar. So. And the reason I bring this slide up is because it, it goes fast. High school goes really fast. And I just want you to know the timeline of, of when to start looking for things. So the first bullet there is, is talking about GPA, class rank, honors, AP, dual credit. So I'm going to go over those very quickly for you. And then um, if you have more questions, you can always reach out to me. I, I love answering questions about anything in general, but um, I always love parents asking questions and challenging me. So GPA stands for grade point average. So at the end of your student's ninth grade year, once they've completed all of ninth grade, they all go home after finals and we're still up here working and all the grades are turned in, then we hit go on the computer and it computes every student's grade point average. So it takes all the grades they've made in any high school credit class and takes the average of them. And then that's how they get their grade point average. Then the computer puts them in order from highest grade point average all the way down to lowest grade point average. And the person with the highest grade point average, you know, at their senior year is called the valedictorian. That's how class rank is done. So, the, you know, there's approximately 275, you know, ninth graders right now. So it, it, that's how, you know, one to, to 275 is how that's done. Honors courses, any honors course, remember I told you, has that 1.2 multiplier. So if your student had a 90 in that course for the first semester, that 90 is not just a 90 when you're computing 
uh, the grade point average, it's going to become 108. So it's going to just boost that GPA and boost that rank and make you even higher. So um, that's how honors AP is what you take when you're in 11th or 12th grader. So when you're a ninth and 10th grader, the honors classes are called honors. And when you're an 11th and 12th grader, the honors classes are called AP. The reason why it changes is because when you're taking AP courses at the end of the course, you have the opportunity, you don't have to, but you have the opportunity to take an AP exam. And if you score well enough on the AP exam, then that can equate to college credit. And it's pretty cheap college credit. I think the AP exam is about $85. And um, that $85 is the cheapest three hours worth of credit I think you may ever find. So it's a pretty neat way to earn college credit. AP classes are also weighted with 1.2 multipliers. And dual credit courses are also weighted with 1.2 multipliers. Dual credit classes are classes available to juniors and seniors. And they are called dual credit because they are taught by a professor from Wharton County Junior College. And so it's a college course that also counts as a high school course. For example, English for dual credit. It's a requirement to graduate from high school. So you can take it just regular English for. You could take English for AP and take the AP exam at the end. Or you could take English for dual credit and you're in the Wharton County Junior College class and then you're earning college credit and you're earning high school credit. That's why it's called dual credit. So, and that is also a 1.2 multiplier. I know I'm throwing a lot of things at you that you think I don't need to worry about that for a while. I just want to introduce you to the terminology so that in a year or two, you're not, you know, blindsided with why didn't I know that? I wish I would have known that. You know, I want, I want you to uh, be well informed for your students and, and students, I want you to be well informed for your future, because this is important to your future. Okay, the next bullet is co-op. So co-op is when your junior and senior year, 11th and 12th grade, if you have high enough grades and you have passed the right amount of, of classes and, you and you're on a good track to graduate, you can use some of your electives and go work. So they do count as state electives and you can go leave campus. And if you have a job, you can work. Now there it, it's associated with the class. You have to keep a, a work log and, and there are, there's paperwork involved with it. You don't just leave and go work. So it is, it is a class involved with it. So you take the class here on campus and then you leave either the last two periods or the last one period of the day and you go to your job. You have to work at least 10 hours per week in order to um, for this to count for, for high school credit um, and for you to be able to leave. And the reason why I bring this up, again, is because if this is something you know is going to be on your student's mind and they're going to want to try to, to take advantage of working while they're in high school um, at, for a credit, then, then they need to take care of all their required electives early on so that they can take advantage of this program. Okay, the next bullet, SAT and ACT. All right, so what prepares you for the SAT and the ACT? Um, taking classes that challenge you. If you are an AP or an honor student, take those classes. The vocabulary and the exposure you get in those classes will help you on the SAT and the ACT test. The SAT and the ACT tests are national standardized tests that colleges use in order for admissions. So they're going to be looking at an SAT and ACT scores for admissions. Scholarship programs will look at your SAT and ACT scores. They're important. You take the SAT and the ACT in the spring of your junior year. It's really not beneficial to start taking it any sooner than that. Um, that's when we encourage students to start taking it as spring of their junior year. Uh, the next bullet, PSAT. So that's the practice SAT. So we do offer that to all of our juniors in October. So in the fall, all juniors will take the practice SAT. And that NMSQ, that's National Merit Scholarship Qualifier. So if your student uh, scores high enough on the PSAT, then they can qualify for a National Merit Scholarship, which is a pretty prestigious 
um, award and an incredible scholarship. So that is offered to all of our juniors here uh, in the in October of their junior year. Uh, we also in the last few years have uh, started offering the SAT. It's paid for by us, a free SAT in the spring of your student's junior year. You do have to sign up, so your students need to listen to announcements, make sure they sign up, but it's a free SAT test. Uh, it's offered here during a school day, so it's not on a Saturday. It's here at Needville High School, and, and it's free, so free. We like free. <laughs> okay, service hours. The next bullet, service hours, getting involved. So colleges, like I told you, colleges like to see what courses you take. Are you taking a rigorous course load? Um, are you challenging yourself? Um, what activities are you involved in? Are you a well-rounded student? Do you volunteer? Um, do you help out with things on the weekends? Do you work? Are you able to have a job? So getting involved, getting service hours is something that's important too. When you apply for college, uh, it's sure it's great to be just smart. That's wonderful. But colleges also like to see that you're a well-rounded individual that can, you know, have a social life with a with activities and, and extracurricular activities and maybe UIL participation. So those are important too, getting involved and getting those service hours. Sorry. And last but not least, when to apply to college. So when you're applying to college, it's like it's getting earlier and earlier and earlier. So those big universities like A&M and UT, you can start applying to those universities in July before you even step foot on campus for your senior year. It's pretty incredible. So you can start applying July, um, you know, the four year universities. Um, like a Texas State or a St. Houston, something like that, is all the fall of your senior year. Now, if you're doing a junior college, which is a great uh, way to start college, I started college at a junior college, then you can wait till the spring of your senior year. But um, you will, you know, your, your students will be talked to numerous times about applying to college, how to do it, where to go. So we don't just, you know, throw them in, in, into the sea and, and tell them to, to go for it. We help them all that we can and uh, like to answer lots of questions from students. It's exciting to us. It's an exciting time. We're excited about just, you know, helping your students here at the high school. That's what we love. We love what we do. I, I work with an, another counselor and, and uh, we have a lot of fun preparing your students for the future. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a, the ninth grade course selection form. So this is what your students will be getting from the high school and they'll be filling this out and returning it back to us. So this is what we require that they, they return to us so that we know what, what they're interested in. So of course you put your name at the top, your ID number. And then if you look, follow along, you've got the different boxes, you know, you've got your four core. Remember, we have to have those four core. That's not, that's a mandatory thing. So whether you're doing English one or English one honors, that's up to you. I told you the different benefits of the honors programs that you need to help, you know, to discuss it further. We can most definitely do that. But you've got your English, you've got your math, science, social studies. So English, you're going to be doing English one or English one honors. Math, you've got Algebra 1, Algebra 1 Honors, or if your student's already done Algebra 1 in eighth grade, you might be, you'll might you be looking at Geometry or Geometry Honors. Science, you've got IPC, Biology, or Biology Honors. So everybody says, what do, how do I know what to take? So if your student really struggles in science, if science is something difficult for them, if they, if they barely pass or if they fail science, then I would recommend them taking IPC. It stands for Integrated Physics and Chemistry. It's just, sorry, a little bit easier version of science. It gets them prepared for biology. Um, biology has an EOC star test attached to it. IPC does not, so they would not be taking a star test in IPC, but it's still a science credit. It's a very good high school science credit that counts as one of those four that they need. 
and then world geography or world geography honors. So you'll student, your student will be choosing one from each one of these boxes. And you've got your foreign language selection. So Spanish one, Spanish one honors, Spanish one native speakers. Okay, what's the difference? Um, Spanish one would be for me because <laughs> I don't know Spanish. Spanish one honors is for a student that would be wanting to maybe doesn't know Spanish one, but's really looking at getting that GPA higher. So they want that honors 1.2 multiplier for their GPA and they're ready to do the extra work that it involves for Spanish one honors. And then you have Spanish one for native speakers. Spanish one for native speakers is for students that they know Spanish, they can speak it, they can read it, they can write it. So what that does, the native speakers class will give you your two foreign language credits in one year. So you get to take care of all your foreign language in that one year and you don't have to worry about it again. And then if your student's already involved in Spanish one in eighth grade and they're passing it, they can do Spanish two or Spanish two honors. So then you've got this big box here, PE or athletics. Now you only have to have one PE credit in order to graduate from Meadville High School or from any high school. So if you want to wait and do PE um, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, you can do that. If you want to go ahead and get the PE taken care of, you can choose a PE here. If you're in athletics, you're going to choose athletics. You can't do athletics and PE. Maybe you're a band student and you know that you can get your PE credit from band then you don't have to choose a PE or athletics. You can choose your band. That can count as your PE. So you may or may not be choosing a PE or an athletics. So this is not mandatory, this box here. So then we have this big giant box here at the bottom, and these are all of our electives. I'm going to go through each elective. I'll give you a little bit of a description, but I know our course selection guide has also been posted on the website, on the Junior High website. Please, I encourage you, open that course selection guide. I know it's big. I know it's lots of reading, but it can help you explore pathways, and it does a very good job of explaining all of our courses. So the first course there in electives is Principles of Human Services. This is kind of like the old homemaking where you're getting a little bit of cooking, a little bit of sewing, a little bit of ch psychology, child development. Then you've got principles of agriculture, food, and natural resources. This is our freshman agriculture class. It's about learning about plants, about animals. If you're wanting to be in the FFA, that's the class that you would have to be in for, um, for FFA. Then you've got introduction to welding, which is just getting you started on learning how to weld, um, which is melting two metals together to form a bond. You've got principles of business, marketing, and finance if you're wanting to be a, a business major or an accountant. Great class. Principles of hospitality and tourism if you'd like to know more about uh, running a restaurant or a hotel. They do some cooking in there, too, so they get to eat. <laughs> principles of construction. This is some, um, some wood shop. It's, it's the beginnings of wood shop and, and architecture. Then the next column is principles of education if you're interested in being a teacher. Principles of health science, if you're interested in nursing, being a doctor, a vet, anything in the healthcare field is, is health science. Principles of law, public safety, and security, if you want to be a, a cop or a policeman or a, a fireman. Debate, debate is if you're interested in being a lawyer. There are um, after school and weekend responsibilities. There's competitions that are mandatory. So I always say that just so that it's not just the class. There are some things after school involved with debate. Journalism, if you would like to write for the yearbook or the newspaper. And you have literary genres where you're reading different types of liter literature, you know, from all different types of genres. And then creative writing. And that's for students that really like to write but don't necessarily want to write for the newspaper or the yearbook. The next column are, uh, are some, the next four classes are our technology credit. So remember, you have to have one technology credit in order to graduate from Needville High School. You don't have to take it your freshman year, so don't feel pressure to do this, but these are some options for you. You've got principles of information technology where you're learning a little bit more about like how to construct the computer. You've got business information management, which is learning about the Microsoft Office, like Word, Excel, PowerPoint. 
you co computer science one, which is introducing you on how to uh, program a computer using different languages. It's an advanced course, so it's going to be tough. But for those students interested in learning about co computer programming, it's an excellent course. You've got computer science two, AP. Now, algebra one is a requirement for that. So this this class would only be available for those freshmen that have taken algebra one in eighth grade. And it is also a computer class where you're learning about uh, computer programming. Okay, so those are our technology classes. And then below that, I have health and speech. Remember, those are both requirements to graduate. Again, you don't have to take them your freshman year. I just put them on there in case that's something you would like to take. They're both semester classes, kind of like Mr. Mikulik and Ms. Frankham's class. So we like to pair them together. Health is learning about your body and speech is, is learning how to talk in public. And then your final column is our fine arts. And you do have to have one fine art before you graduate. Again, you don't have to take it next year, but you do have to have at least one. So you've got band, which is, can also count as your PE credit and your fine art credit. Jazz band, which is another fine art. And typically jazz band is for someone that's already in band. Choir, we know what choir is. <laughs> Theater arts and theater production. So theater arts is for students that just want to participate in theater during the class period. They don't want to do anything with the plays on the weekends or at night. And then theater production is for students that want to act or do the set or the lighting or the technology in the actual production. So it's a class during school and you're, res you're responsible for being there after school and on the weekends to help with the productions and the musicals. And then the last class there is art, which is just drawing and it's a fine art credit, drawing and constructing things. So those are all the classes available to your ninth grade student or if you're a student, then it's available to you. It's exciting. I ask that you rank your electives from one through seven um, because what if one of your electives um, falls during class period that you can't take it and, and we have to have a backup. And so this is just something so that we know what you're interested in. So be sure and tell us the ones that you would like to take one through seven. At the bottom, I, I did list the required electives. It's just a reminder that you do need a technology, a fine art, speech, health, and PE. You don't have to take all of those in your ninth grade year. It's just a reminder that you um, remember what you, what's required of you. And then the last thing at the bottom there is your endorsement area. You do have to select an endorsement area. Again, you can change it anytime, no pressure, but choose one or at least one. And um, that way we have that on record. And then, um, and if you ever wanted to change it or discuss it, we can most definitely do that. So there's your ninth grade course selection form and all its glory. So, and they just keep getting bigger and more choices every year in high school. It's really exciting. We, uh, we love seeing freshman faces. They say there's so much freedom. There's so much we can choose. So it's exciting. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up with, first of all, parents, if you're watching this and you just completely melted down and, and you're freaking out, don't, because we're here for you. We're here for your babies. We're here for your, you know, your grown up babies, your you know, little babies, whatever. We're here for you. We're going to take care of them. We're going to make sure that they're taking the classes they need to take in order to graduate. We look student by student at every student's schedule and make sure that they're in the right class. I'm not going to say we're perfect, but we do look student by student and make sure that they're in the right classes. Um, always feel comfortable to email me or call me. I will say that email is much more effective because I can answer that from home and I do that a lot. I answer things from home. Um, feel free to call me. Uh, I love to hear from parents. I really love to hear from students. It's exciting. Um, so we're here for your students. Last but not least, I know I talked a lot about classes and four-year plans and college, but mental health is a real thing, especially with COVID. Uh, anxiety is a real thing. Depression is a real thing. And we're here for your students for that as well. So we're not just glorified schedulers. We're, uh, we're actually here for your students' mental 
help as well. So I get it. The times are tough right now. And we're going to be here for your students through all that. Thank you again for watching this, taking the time. Again, there's my email and my phone number. Feel free to call me anytime. It was a pleasure. Thanks.